we have Carol Ford and Linda Groundwater with us. They are two of the three biographers of Bob Crane, the definitive biography. So um, would you guys mind telling us, giving us a little bit of your background? Sure. Uh, Linda, you want to go first? Why not? Sure. <laughs> um, I am an American. I'm not sure how much of my accent sticks one way or the other anymore, but I am living in Australia. I moved here uh, almost 30 years ago. Um, I grew up in New England and I studied uh, communications in English at Riviera College, now University in Nashville, New Hampshire, and went on to work as a radio news reporter for several years before we came down uh, to Australia. I then continued doing other work and at one point stumbled across what became a huge project idea and it expanded into this book and these podcasts and our continuing projects. And that's me. Carol, what about you? <laughs> what about me? What um, about you? <laughs> I, uh, I am an American, but I am not living in Australia or any other country, although I like to visit lots of other countries. <laughs> um, I am uh, and I'm the director of editorial services and a managing editor for a healthcare publishing firm uh, here in South Jersey. I uh, graduated with uh, my bachelor. I got my bachelor's degree from Glassboro State College, which is now Rowan University. Uh, at my current job, I am the managing editor for several uh, healthcare, uh, nursing publications, core curriculums, journals, peer reviewed journals, uh, and so forth. I like Linda, also had um, kind of stumbled onto Hogan's Heroes early in life, and uh, she and Dee and I connected up, uh, kind of, this is kind of the abridged version, but we we kind of connect, connected up uh, in this effort to research Bob Crane and tell his complete and true story. We are all uh, Hogan's Heroes fans, of course, but we wanted to learn more about what made Bob Crane tick. Linda comes at it from a place of uh, a journalist experience with her degrees are in communications and journalism and her work in radio in New England. I come at it from uh, the writing and the editorial experience. And Dee, who is not with us, Dee Young, worked at WICC for many, many years, uh, over 40 years, met Bob Crane when he visited the station back in 19... 76 to help the station celebrate its 50th anniversary and was really instrumental in opening up the world of Connecticut radio, which is vast and, and really dynamic and was able to bring that world of Connecticut radio to the forefront for all of us. And so that is really who we are in a nutshell. Um, and thank you, Didi, for having us on today. Absolutely. This is fascinating for me. Um, so have you guys ever done anything like this? Like, I mean, this book is really lengthy. And, and I mean, you guys talk to like, I mean, it seems like hundreds of people. Have you done anything like this? Or like, was there just something about Bob Crane specifically that you guys were attracted to? I, I think this is probably the only <laughs> book we have in us. I, I don't think uh, I can do this again. I I can, we we, we sometimes talk than, about we sometimes talk about doing it, but then it's like, yep, yeah, nope. <laughs> yeah, it, it, I, I all don't... we'll do is expand on this one. But no, we have yeah. we haven't done anything like this before. Um, no. We did speak to over two hundred people at all hours of the day and night over a twelve year period, mm -hmm. um, and and it was uh, it was a privilege and it was a journey and it was a lot of work and it was a lot of lost sleep um, for both. Carol and me and for Dee and particularly for me because we were doing a lot of these interviews in the middle of the night where <laughs> my time uh, and I would get up at one in the morning do an interview for an hour or an hour and a half go back to bed and get up for work in the morning and then start all over again uh, so no this this is a um, it was truly uh, an organic spontaneous uh, project it began uh, just by one day I was watching Hogan's Heroes, as Carol said, we kind of rediscovered them after years of not seeing them, but growing up with them, of course. So knowing all the characters and whatnot. And then we um, I watched the television and said, gee, I remember enjoying this with my dad. And gee, didn't Bob Crane die? And 
I looked it up online and I saw all sorts of stuff and some of it good, so most of it not so good. Um, and the good stuff I found, the interesting stuff I found, because I didn't just find sex and murder interesting, although it is interesting, but it wasn't the only thing that I was interested in. Uh, all this other stuff about Bob's life was buried way at the bottom of the list. And I said, gee, that's not fair. Why doesn't anybody know this? Mm -hmm. And that simple thought created this massive undertaking, um, which Carol joined two or three years in, and I had D a little earlier in, and then, you know, travel across the world and for both of us. And it was just uh, an experience and a, a privilege, uh, but probably something we will never do again. <laughs> and, to, you know, also, I don't think, you know, by not to, you know, writing a biography, researching a, a biography, is very tedious. It's very, you know, you want to gather the evidence to make sure that the story that you're telling is correct, is accurate. You want to make sure that you are corroborating. You're not just going to one or two or three people or 10 people, but to get a, a vast array of different people from every angle of, of, of the person's life. And, and that being said, between Linda and Dee and myself, I, I really think that our biography on Bob Crane is unique by way of how biographies are done um, in other, in, you know, by other biographers. We have really worked hard on making sure that we have left no stone unturned. And, you know, would we have wanted more? Sure. Is the book very long? Sure. But you know what? What all of that does is it presents Bob Crane through the eyes of the people who knew him, whether they were school friends or family members going all the way back to when he was a kid, uh, or are they people who knew him later in life, who worked with him on stage, right to the person who discovered his body, who was working with him in theater uh, in the play Beginner's Luck and discovered his body on the morning of June 29th. 1978. So all of that said, we worked very hard. We worked together in tandem. We were, you know, we worked in a way that I don't think that this, because of Bob Crane's, um, you know, I, I don't want to say legacy because we believe he has a different legacy, a better legacy than the one that has been pushed on him. Um, but what people know of him, the murder and the sex scandal and whatnot, I really don't think that this book could have been done by just one person because of the way that Linda and Dee and I had worked together and brought this entire book together and brought it to life. Oh, agreed. And and particularly in this case, I'll just say that um, when Carol was talking about, you know, going to several sources for the same information kind of thing. It was particularly important in this case that we corroborate, 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 because so much that was out there was wrong. And no one had bothered to really look at what might be true and what might not be true. And in some cases, we spoke to people who embellished things and you could tell they were embellishing things. And in some cases, people just wrongly remembered things. Uh, because when you've got somebody like Bob and it's become such an explosive uh, story, you know, even in your own memory, sometimes we're all guilty of going, did I do that? Did I know that? Or did I just think I knew that? You know, and, and with Bob's story, there is so much out there that is just an outright lie that if we didn't corroborate and just went out with this book and said, this is our story, this is Bob's true story, people wouldn't believe it mm -hmm. or would be less inclined to believe it because, well, one person said that, who cares? But if you get five people saying this, they can't all be wrong. Or 200. <laughs> Yeah, we've got 200 people who told us what was their truth. Mm -hmm. And one thing I find it um, interesting. Um, so I really like what you did with this book that you corroborated so much and you really put together a story that is seemingly accurate and true, but for some reason we didn't see it in the media. And I think that's one thing I, I like to talk about in my podcast. It's not just the true crime of it, but the celebrity part of it makes it so that 
they can't possibly really have a fair trial. And we don't always get all the information. And along with that, I mean, of these 200 people you guys interviewed, and I, I heard in your podcasts, you guys talking about how as you started interviewing these people, it was really hard for to get some of them to speak to you because it was like the media only wanted the scandal and they were sick of talking about that. Is that right? Can you tell me more? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, yes. absolutely. I, you know, and you know, we were told by you now Larry Hovis who played uh, Sergeant Carter on Hogan's heroes, the cast of Hogan's heroes. Um, they actually made a pact that after Bob died, that they would talk to the media, but they would talk to the media and tell good stories about Bob, you know, that they, the, the way that they remembered him, the way that they wanted him to be remembered and they, they got no takers. They were, they were turned down. And so, you know, it was, it was really challenging to have people come on board in the beginning. And what happened was one, we, we would get a couple of people like Arlene Martell and Cynthia Lynn, both who were on Hogan's Heroes. And then a couple other people started to come on board, like Jerry London and Robert Butler and Bruce Bilson, who were directors uh, on, on Hogan's Heroes. And then we get Al Ruddy. Now, Al Ruddy is one of the co-creators. And so it starts to snowball <laughs> when Linda's laughing because she loves that, how that interview came to pass. Um, but that snowballs into more and more people. Robert Clary, who who we both adored, who, re, you know, he, he, you would think that he would be really eager because he seemed to get along with Bob and he did. But he was really hard to convince. Uh, Arlene Martell called him several times mm -hmm. early on <laughs> in in our work with with this. And Arlene was, you know, speaking up for us to him and saying, you know, no, 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 you have to talk to these ladies. They're they're doing a good thing. And he was very, very skittish. And it took almost until the very, very end for him to send a, years. a hand, yes, a handwritten years. letter to Linda sharing his thoughts. I mean, these people had gotten burned. They were not, you know, when, when, it, when you're looking at the whole, you know, celebrity piece of it, you know, that you're, like you said, Didi, it's like judge and jury out there. there. There's really no room for, you know, sidestepping public opinion. And when the public gets a hold of something and the media keeps throwing it at you. We have people telling us constantly, oh, well, didn't you see that film about Bob Crane? That's all you oh. need to know. And mm -hmm. we can't even get past that that talking point with some people because it's in the movie, it's on film, it was made by Hollywood, and that's the be-all, tell-all. And yet that film is nothing but uh, fabrication and exaggeration and in some cases, outward lies. And yet, an, an, a public a, a, that doesn't know any different, and I don't blame them, but they don't know any different. So they come at us and say, well, didn't you see that film? It, it gets frustrating, but yet here we are. And this is why we continue to do what we do. We, it wasn't just, okay, we wrote a book. Now we're going to move on to the next one. It's, we are doing this because there is, a bigger purpose to clearing Bob's name in the media and in the court of public opinion. And and clearly there are over 200 people who also want to get that side of the story out. Oh yeah. Yes. Which is, it's interesting because it's not like you're choosing one side of the story. It's just that the, the big picture is getting buried in this one tiny piece that yes. the media made explode. Yes. Yes. I mean, and, and let's, I, I mean, to give, to give media, I mean, as a media, person myself I can see why I mean and people even who aren't in media can probably see why the media seized on the sensational he was a very likable man he was very charismatic he was a hero you know on television so and people cling to those characters and this man was murdered and he was murdered in his sleep and he was a young man. And gosh, we didn't know about this addiction that he had, which of course they didn't look at as an addiction back then. It was, you know, when you look at the media reports and things, they just said, you know, he was some kind of pervert or blah, 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 blah. And so, wow, isn't that fascinating? So you can understand why they grabbed onto that. But the problem with the way it was done was 
there really was, aside from the absolute mess that the police made of the crime scene and the whole investigation, there was no one there to stand up for Bob and say, hey, that wasn't the way it was. And that's not all I was. And because all of that was seized upon, and then you get a crime writer like Robert Gray Smith, who's a good crime writer and who actually said to us that the world absolutely needs a serious biography about this very intriguing man. And that was terrific because he understood that what he was doing was only focusing on the crime. And that's what he excels at. But he even grabbed a few things out of the media that he didn't bother to fact check. And we'll just leave that discussion aside, but about other parts of Bob's life. But he focused on the crime. And because, of course, I mean, as a crime writer, that's what he did. But then that crime story became a film that then absorbed and uh, expanded all the things that were wrong about what was being said about Bob and about his life and about the way he conducted himself and whatnot, because it was only focusing on the things around the crime and making presumptions about the other parts of his life. And so that became what people believe is true because gee, a crime not a crime story is true. Well, yeah, but all the bits around it may not be. And that just did not, that left no one um, to tell the actual story of Bob. And that's what we're doing. And it also took away any perspective mm. of Bob Crane as a human being. I mean, I mean, let's face it, sex and crime and murder, that, that all sells. I mean, you've got, you know, investigation discovery with every single show that they have on their network is about this is about not Bob Crane, but about true crime and true murder. And even I get sucked into it and it's, oh, I watch know, it. okay, you know, we're, we're you, <laughs> know, ooh, you know, for the let's win. watch all this. Um, but there's no perspective left on Bob Crane. He's two dimensional. People only remember him for Hogan's heroes. He got murdered. Uh, sometimes they don't even remember how he got murdered. Sometimes they think he committed suicide. Sometimes, you know, you, you get all, all different he and was then shot, of course, he was stabbed. He was, you know, all yeah. the way. And then of course you get the, you know, the the sex part where, oh, you know, I wish I had that kind of addiction, and you know, all of those kinds of things. And then then he becomes the butt of all jokes. Oh, you know, he was this, he was that, and and he his legacy has become everything that would horrify him were he still alive today. And we know that because the people that we have spoken to, his his family, his dearest friends, his colleagues in, in every line of work, radio, television, theater, film, you know, they all tell us the same thing, that this was not who, this is not our Bob Crane. This is not who he was. Mm -hmm. And we're in this with you now. And we're going to help you tell his story. Well, I think that's amazing. And I'm I'm really happy that we can uh, continue to tell this story here. And I hope it reaches more people. Um, oh, goodness, I was about to ask you something. Um, one second. So with the sex addiction too, I mean, it sounds like the media really blew it up and they, they called it a sex addiction and the, this videotaping addiction and stuff. But it sounds like one, from all accounts, it was consensual. And two, he was trying to change that towards the end of his life. Is that right? Well, yes to the last part, no to the first part. Um, the media didn't call it an addiction. The media just said he was a pervert. That's right. Yes. Bob Bob was an addict. Pausing for a sec because my dog is barking up a storm here. <laughs> I I heard that. I I didn't know if it was cinnamon or uh or if Didi, if you had a puppy dog running around too. <laughs> Why don't um, you continue, Carol? I sure. will mute my mic for a sec. <laughs> so yeah, so um the media 
hooked into the whole creep pervert um couldn't control himself and the media didn't say he was having sex with th that was not you know consensual but other people latch on to that and they you know especially with the me too movement and all of this that has right and rightfully so come to to the forefront uh but that was not bob crane bob crane was very interested in having relations with many many different women but what he was not interested in was forcing women to do anything that they didn't want to do, be that having sex or be that being photographed or be that ha having them videotaped. Um, Bob wanted them to enjoy the experience as much as he was enjoying the experience, or at least uh, in the moment, we'll say enjoying the experience. Uh, because as we discovered at, through our research is that, you know, as he, dis as he accepted that he was a sexual addict and started seeking help for it, he admitted to his counselor that he was a sexual addict and that he wanted to change. But we'll say in the moment that he wanted to enjoy it as much as the women and vice versa. So there was no drugging. This was not a case of Bill Cosby. This was not a case of um, anything that would be considered illegal um, outside the realm of him cheating on his first wife or cheating on a second wife. Now, both of his wives were aware of his promiscuity and his sexual relations with other women. Uh, his first wife, they were married for 20 years and were divorced. His second wife, uh, Patricia Olson, who was Sigrid Valdis, who played Clink's second secretary on Hogan's Heroes, she got into the marriage fully aware of Bob's uh, sexual proclivities. And she said she, you know, at that time that she was fine with him having those relations as long as he came home to her. Um, so, you know, and whatever was happening between Bob and his first wife with regard to what, how much they knew, how much they approved, whatever, it seemed to be working for each of them in their marriages during those times. And that's up, not up for us to judge. Now, as Bob moved on in this, this realm and he is introduced to videotaping, in addition to still photography, uh, you know, vi videotape was very, very much in its infancy back in the 1970s. And this is how he is connected up with, John Henry Carpenter, who has always been the prime suspect, who was arrested in the early 1990s and tried, but then acquitted for the crime due to lack of physical evidence. Um, he kind of used John Carpenter as his source for parts for videotaping and whatnot. Now, the media blows John Carpenter up uh, and the film also blows John Carpenter up as this, you know, really technical wizard who knew how to do all of these things. And that's why Bob was hanging around him. But really, John Carpenter was just kind of the parts guy. You know, he really wasn't as important in Bob's life as he is portrayed in the film. And that is through even director Paul Schrader's own admission um, in a quote to the New York Times. John Carpenter was really just the guy who was getting the parts who was, you know, he was able to, you know, help Bob obtain the cameras and, and so forth for the video, you know, the video equipment that he was using for these sexual um, encounters. Uh, but he wasn't really the, the guru that uh, they made him mm -hmm. out to be. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't Bob's best friend either. Um, you know, he may have been a friend of sorts, a friendly acquaintance a friend, whatever, but he wasn't he his was best enabler. friend. He was an enabler. He, he was, was an enabler. enabler but he was not his best friend. Who, oh, this is Bob's only friend. He had no other friends as the media, as the the film, try and make you believe. So so there are all different angles there. And I've, I've just covered a, like, a whole lot of ground there. But in the end, um, you know, John Carpenter wasn't, you know, this great, important person when it came to um, Bob's life or 
you know, being able to fix these things. It, it was, it was, you know, really Bob who was able to do the technical stuff. Well, because as, as Bob's son, Scott told us and said to me again, when we were together last month, there is no reason for people to believe other than what's in the film that John Carpenter was there as the guy to, to do everything for Bob because Bob had created all his own equipment. You know, he'd set up the, the horseshoe turntable rack and he did all his own things at home. So why was he going to need this guy for that? Why was he going to need this guy for that? And in terms of the film, the last comment I wish to make about this horrible thing is the director actually said to the New York Times, and I'm quoting here, my intent with autofocus is not to be true or definitive. People's lives are not really that interesting. And with Crane, I wanted to get at something meaty. Otherwise, who cares? Well, if he didn't want to bother telling the truth, he should have left Bob's name out of the film and just made up a fictional story. Because what he did by making this film was embed in people's li uh, minds that that is what Bob was. Because most people who see who saw that film, which thankfully it flopped miserable, miserably and a lot of people didn't see it, but of course it's spread around the internet, is they're not going to see that little quote that he gave to the New York Times. They're going to look at that film and say, here's the true story. And that's what basically... It, what a it's, loss. It's character assassination, no matter how you look at it. Yeah, it's insane. It's it's almost like they can write a story about the, like this wild story with awful characters and then name the character after a real person. And how can people do that? And who's going to like that guy? I mean, there was nobody likable in that film. Mm -mm. No. I mean, nobody. Mm -hmm. Nobody. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, oh, we're running out of time. We might have to start this, start a new Zoom over if we run out of time. That's okay. Um, that's okay. We're used to that. Yep. <laughs> well, I did want to ask you, um, so back then in the 70s, I mean, was sex addiction even something that was recognized, acknowledged? I mean, no. by, mm -hmm. by layman? No. 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 Not it at was, all. It was really in its infancy. And I think when Reverend Beck talked to us, Linda, I think, you know, he you know, he gave us three very long and detailed uh, transcripts of uh, recordings of his recollections of counseling Bob Crane in the weeks leading up to Bob Crane's murder. And sex addiction was in its infancy, but not widespread, not as we think of it today. It wouldn't have been something that we would have, they would have automatically known what that was. They would have known what an alcoholic was. They would have known um, if somebody was was doing drugs, uh, but they would not have necessarily known sex addiction. Now, with Reverend Beck being a counselor and knowing psychiatrists and psychologists in, you know, in his, he, he was a minister, um, but knowing, you know, that whole, whole arm of it, because Reverend Beck did um, counsel people for alcohol addiction. Um, so he would have been maybe the one to use the term sex addiction, but it was something that Bob understood himself to be in the conversations with Reverend Beck. And even now, people do not understand sex addiction because we still, when people talk about sex, they revert to being 12 year olds. He, 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 sex addiction. He, he, he. You know, mm -hmm. it's sex. He, he, you know, and and it's and they look at sex as something that you can have or not have or do or not do. And they don't understand the very chemical component to sex. And that's OK. But you hear these, you know, you hear this rubbish, which just makes continues that that misinformation for instance David Duchovny at one point said he was a sex addict and went to rehab for the weekend 
Woohoo. Right. Well, that'll yeah. get you over yeah. it. You know, yes, I can I can not have sex for the weekend. <laughs> wow. Well, a lot of us don't have sex for the weekend, you know. <laughs> you know, um, you know, it, and uh, the Reverend Beck said, you know, Bob tried many times to stop this addiction himself. He would say, you know, I'm going to this town and I'm not going to ha- do this behavior. He said, and that's going to last her about five minutes because a true sex addiction is as hard to defeat as some of the hardest drugs. And that comes from sex addiction specialists and from the Reverend Beck who told us that as well. Your Mm -hmm. hardest drugs are very hard to beat and you're not surrounded by them all the time. It's really hard to find an area of the world that doesn't have any women in it. Mm -hmm. So Bob had an actual addiction and an addiction can take years and it is a long fight and it is a hard fight, and he was willing to take those steps. But it is a true addiction. There's no weekend cure. And then you've got people like Tiger Woods, who he wasn't a sex addict, he was just a jerk. You know, (laughs) Um, and the people who then say, you know, he used it as an excuse to cheat on his wife. Hey, if you want to cheat on your wife, you might have sex with one or two women or have a couple of affairs. You're not having sex with literally hundreds of women. That is not an excuse to cheat on your wife. That is something else entirely. So back in the day, in the 70s, we we're talking about sex addiction was not a known thing at all. And even now in, you know, the 2020s, There's a bit of an understanding, but it still has a long, long way to go. People don't understand this kind of addiction because it's something that they think is pleasurable, legal, and, you know, take it or leave it. Everything else is just an excuse. And that's not how addiction works and certainly not this kind of addiction. And Bob had a very, very hard, long-standing addiction. He'd had this addiction for more than 20 years. It wasn't way back in Hollywood and became a bad boy. Bob had this addiction from the 1950s. Mm -hmm. And people just didn't know that. And so they just thought, oh, he went to Hollywood, became a bad boy, and she wasn't here pervert. That's not how it worked. Yeah, it kind of goes back to what we were saying about uh, being a celebrity. And it's I mean, it seems like sometimes they have their advantages and sometimes there's the disadvantages that they they can't escape that, that they kind of become what what we see. And that's it's almost like that's all that matters, which is. Well, a- and yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Didi. Um, it's it's like we look at celebrities and they live in these, you know, big, untouchable places, you know, way high up that we can't reach. And when a celebrity falls, what happens? Everybody has an opinion. Everybody has something to say. And you base your opinions on the information that is being given to you. And in Bob's case, the information that's being given to us is from the media is he was on Hogan's Heroes. He was murdered. He during the murder investigation, we found that he was into amateur pornography and had sex with loads of women. And the character that he plays on Hogan's Heroes is this infallible character. You know, he doesn't, you know, he never seems to fail. He is stoic. He is, you know, he's a hero. And yet over here, what we have is this fall from grace that people look at and go, oh, my goodness. I, I I can't believe that Colonel Hogan was into all this. Ew, yuck. I can never watch Hogan's Heroes ever again. And that's what has happened in Bob's case. Now, we have been able to slow down that runaway train, but we haven't been able to stop it or reverse it. And, you know, that that's really, it's a shame because when Bob was trying at the end of his life to take those baby steps to you know, say, okay, I'm going to try and work on bettering my life. I'm going to do these things. I'm, I, I love my, my children. I, I want to get my career back on track. And then somebody comes out of the clear blue and murders him. Um, yeah, that's tragic. That's, that's, it's beyond tragic. It's kind of insane how quickly his audience turned their backs on him, considering, especially, it seems like by many, many accounts, it was consensual. And I mean, it's not like, look at how many people defend uh, Woody Allen and Bill Cosby and mm-hmm. are back on Bob Crane, who, mm-hmm. I mean, he wasn't, he wasn't hurting anybody. No. Mm-hmm. No, but mean, he was a victim. Yes. So it was easy. There was no one 
to, there was no one to blame but himself. You know, there are people we have, I mean, the things that we have heard and seen and the things that Bob's children have told me that people have said to them, it is extraordinary. Uh, the lengths that people have gone to. And I think it's because in part that they have seen Bob as Colonel Hogan, as in he is that perfect he leader. Um, he is a hero. He is someone to look up to. He is larger than life. He was never just Bob. He was always someone else. And so when he becomes human and has human issues and human addictions, that's his fault. Got to be his fault. You betrayed me. And so therefore you deserve to, you got everything you deserved. You know, really? I, mm -hmm. I've said this often in the past and I still stand by it. I know no one who as a child said, I would like to be an addict when I grow up. Please make my life miserable. Bob was not enjoying his addiction. Did he occasion, did he enjoy the sex as he has said to a friend of his, yeah, you know, I like sex. Sure. But he wasn't doing it to just enjoy sex. This was a need that he had. And for people to then turn around and say, you know, you deserve this. Or, you know, there's they give everyone else a pass. He doesn't get a pass because they saw him as someone else. I agree with you. Okay, so I was... Um reading and listening and i learned that in bob's last couple of interviews he was talking about death a lot is that right so what do you guys think about that what does that mean it means it's wrong yep <laughs> it's wrong it's one yeah. of the things that are wrong yeah um one of the the biggest examples of that is celebrity cooks and yeah. celebrity cooks was a canadian television show filmed out of vancouver it was a celebrity, you know, cooking show. They would invite different actors, actresses, musicians on to prepare a meal. And, you know, then they would have a lot of fun doing it. The host, Bruno Jeruzzi, was a much beloved Canadian uh, personality uh, during the 1970s and 80s. And by all accounts, and when I say all, <laughs> I literally mean all accounts of people who were there on the day of taping, uh, the owner, the set, ma uh, the stage manager, the uh, uh, agent, the talent agent, the photographer, people who had seen the show, um, they they all said Bob Crane was one of their best guests. And and how this gets all blown up out of proportion is in the United States. Celebrity Cooks was picked up in a couple different markets in the United States. And the first one was somewhere in upstate New York where um, the affiliate, the CBS affiliate, was going to air Celebrity Cooks to this demographic in the you know upper uh, northeast of the United States. And Bob Crane's episode was so popular and so very successful that that was actually going to lead off the the the, the show um the run of the show in the united states in syndication it was going to air in early july of 1978 and then what happens bob crane dies he is murdered on june 29th so what you have here is a 15 minutes of fame uh situation so the network affiliate, um, he hears that Bob Crane has been murdered. Celebrity Cooks is going to begin airing in just a few days. His episode is first in the queue. So he goes and he allegedly watches this episode now for the first time. And he is horrified by what he sees, which is Bob Crane making all of these terrible jokes about death and sex. And he breaks down and cries and he can't hold it together. And, oh, he is just a one hot mess in this episode. And because of how he feels so, you know, this this network uh, executive, he feels so horrified by what, by what he has seen that he pulls the show from that, that episode from the lineup. And then in some way, shape or form, I don't know if he called the, and I use the term loosely, journalist for one of the um, magazines, one of the 
uh, trade magazines. It wasn't like a tabloid. It was like a photo play or a uh, photo mirror or what, whatever those magazines were back in the, in the, in the day. Um, but somehow or other, he gets interviewed for an, a large article about Bob Crane. And he tells this writer for this magazine that, you know, exactly what I just said. He was, he saw the episode for the first time, just days before it was supposed to air. Uh, and he just was horrified and he pulls it and he t- says he's, he's doing all these things. And even in the article, the writer says, well, can you be more specific? And he says, well, no, I can't really give you many, any details, but I just know I had a weird feeling about the whole thing. This piece gets alluded to in Robert Graysmith's book. He writes about it. He doesn't give much much detail to it, but he does he does write about how Bob Crane breaks down on the set of Celebrity Cooks. That then, that entire scene, then gets dramatized in the biopic. So when Linda and I were reaching out to the Celebrity Cooks people, we were, Linda, weren't we? We were expecting... Oh. A much different answer than like what we got. Radio, yeah, my mm-hmm. interview prep was, you know, this is a um, this is a very big change from everything else we've seen about Bob. You know, we really need to understand what was happening here. This adds another layer to the story for us to understand what was going on. And so when they came, and and I think it was Anne Care, the first person who said to Carol when she mentioned it. Her answer was no, 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 no. Yes. Absolutely uh, no, never, no. no. I mean, you couldn't possibly get a more negative response to that. And she was on the floor. And she said, I was on the floor the entire time. I was with them all day. No, never, 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 never. And they were so angry that this made up story became part of a legacy that shouldn't have existed because it was completely untrue. And we had three people we did. Ex- and the reason that the, the book has their full interviews in it uh, regarding this is it is such a huge example of what people believe to be true, that we believed we needed to actually say, here is the story from the horse's mouth. These people were there. They're telling you this was a lie. This was not true. And Erdell turned out to be, you know, he was nobody. And no, Mm -hmm. I can't give you any examples. And is there any video of this program? Very little. We only see the end. Um, Mm -hmm. And and it does include my my favorite little dad joke (laughs) of of Bob's. Uh, And the only (laughs) the only mention of 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 death or gruesomeness in it is they they're at the end of the show and eating dinner because they had some kind of disaster during the cooking of the meal. Mm-hmm. And it didn't get done. Yeah, the chicken was didn't raw. get done, and <laughs> you know, but they're sitting down. Here's one we prepared earlier, and they sit down and they're having this meal, and um, Bob's sitting there eating, and I just loved it. it was so throwaway, and you can find this on YouTube where he, mm-hmm. down, he says he says you know two cannibals are sitting down having dinner and one cannibal says, you know, I really can't stand my mother-in-law. And the other one says, well, just eat your peas. <laughs> that's it. That's that. I mean, it's a horrible, it's, it's a horrible a, joke. It's a dad it's joke. so bad, <laughs> but it is just, but it's, but that's who Bob was. Mm-hmm. That's who Bob was. And there was no, he said, geez, if he'd have been crying and, and carrying on and mm-hmm. telling sex jokes. And he said, we never would have run that. This ran at three o'clock in the afternoon. We couldn't yeah. have anything like that on the air yeah and it ran it ran several times in canada Mm -hmm. it ran several times in canada (laughs) yeah you You can't get more polite than more unoffensive than canada right and to the point where it was such a good episode that they said this is the one we're going to lead with when it comes into the states so if that's such a, I mean, why would they put on something horrible and have the guests standing there crying and telling f- details about his life? It just they, makes no sense. No, it doesn't, didn't even make sense. But to Graysmith's quote unquote credit, um, he just lifted that from the Erdell article. His, his uh, downfall was that as a true crime writer, as in nonfiction, he should be checking his sources. 
and he did not check this. He just lifted it, okay. but it wasn't supposed to be the focus of his writing. As Carol said, it just kind of got lifted out of there and dramatized in film. And the other thing about this film, I will just say, is people use it as a source of truth because Bob's oldest son was in a very small way involved in it. That doesn't mean it's true. It means his oldest son had no idea what he was doing. Uh, and for whatever reasons he chose to be involved in it, he chose to be involved in it. And it's not our place to figure out why or guess why or whatever, but it doesn't make the story true. And it backfired on him in a huge way. Um, but it it's not a true story. And so there was not a lot of talk about death. Bob did an interview um, just before he passed away in which he was very positive and he had a new show in the works. And um, Carol, you can explain mm -hmm. this, this part, yeah. but Bob was very optimistic. Um, mm -hmm. Like an actor has said often, you know, you always hope that there's a pony in the next room and you just keep going. And Carol, you explain, cause you know that interview very well. And I think it's really important to show how Bob really was versus the way he's been portrayed here. Right. So at the very end of his life, he, Bob was in Scottsdale, Arizona. It was maybe a week at most before his murder. And he has an interview as, as Bob did. I mean, when he traveled all over the country, with dinner theater. And, and I want to just say here, I'll get back to the interview in just a second, but it wasn't just, you know, Bob going and doing beginner's luck in 1976, 1977, 1978, he was doing beginner's luck all the way back to 1969, 1970. And he was doing theater as far back as 1960, 1959. So it wasn't that he was just, you know, now he was trying to find his niche in a new show and you know trying to find his footing again with with getting a new show in Hollywood and 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 doing that and so in the meantime he had to pay the bills and so that kept him on the road a lot but dinner theater while it was a step down from Hogan's Heroes it was something that he had been doing for a couple of decades it wasn't just the last couple of years of his life uh, but he would go and have interviews uh, to talk about his his uh, play that would be that he would be performing in in whichever town, whether it be Scottsdale or Dallas or Seattle or or anywhere in in the country. And this last interview that he gave, he he talked a lot about. He, he was very optimistic. His optimism. The reporter could tell that his optimism was shining through. The one thing that he was very sad about was that he and his then estranged wife, Patricia Olson, were separated. They were in the middle of getting a divorce. There is rumor or speculation that they may have reconciled. We will never know. But he was optimistic regardless. And he was talking to this reporter about all that he had you know, coming up, he had some, he had a show called the Hawaii experience that he had just shot a pilot for in Hawaii back in January and February. He had other things that he was getting off the pad, as he would say, or off the launch pad, off the ground. He, he had different things going on. Plus he was also working on bettering himself as we've talked about. Um, but what he told the reporter, this, this newspaper reporter, was that he, he if he were going to write his own autobiography, he would title it Laughing All the Way to the Grave because he always tried to see the, optimis the optimistic side of things, the positive side of things. I can't tell you how many people would tell us that he was a very positive person. He was always trying to do good things for other people. He was very charitable. He was always looking out for other people, helping other people. Uh, because of Bob Crane not wanting to do a game show, he turned the producers on to somebody else. And that person was Richard Dawson, who then became the host of Family Feud 
and went on to be a multi, multi successful millionaire and do wonderful things with that show. But it was because Bob Crane said, you know what, I'm not interested in doing game shows. Richard Dawson might be your better pick. Um, you know, so he was always doing, looking out for other people, doing these positive things. And he had a very positive, sunny outlook on life. His, you know, one of his friends from school said we could use some of his sunshine now, um, you know, but what you see in the film is him walking around Scottsdale with his jacket on his Hogan's leather jacket and, and crying. And then the voiceover says, thank you for killing me because I was just, you know, terrible anyway, you know, and it's, it's, it's tragic because that is not who Bob Crane was. Bob Crane did not go to bed on the night of June 28th, 1978, thinking he wasn't going to wake up in the morning. He, he went to bed like we all go to bed every night and somebody killed him in his sleep. And that is, that is the tragedy in that he is a murder victim. He cannot speak for himself. He cannot stand up and defend himself. And so we do our best to do that for him. Well, I think that's incredible. Um, I really appreciate what you guys have done. I don't think I haven't read another book or biography of all the celebrities I've covered where somebody was so detailed and worked so hard to find the people close to him. And I mean, it, you guys went back to like his school teachers and stuff. Like, I think it's incredible that you guys work so hard to get the true story. Thank you. I, th I think part of it is that we've never done it before. So we don't know any other way to do it. <laughs> you know, I mean, to, to us, the, the way to find out about a person's life is to talk to everybody they know uh, and not just cherry pick who's going to give us the the most juicy uh, or the most scandalous or, uh, you know, the, the most um, tantalizing or titillating stories. That That isn't how we tell someone's, that's not how you learn about someone. That's not how you tell about someone's life. The way you tell about someone's life is to find people in all aspects of their life and see how that person grew. One of the one of the very first people I spoke to was Bob's cousin, Jim Senich. And it was a true reckoning for me in terms of this is how to approach this story. He called him Bobby when he spoke to me. He would say, you know, Bobby was a, a big teddy bear. He was a big teddy bear and he wanted to help people. And people think he walked around with horns sticking out of his head, but it's just not true. And when you have someone who was that close to your subject, they spent every weekend together growing up at their grandmother's house and whatnot, that this person is directly affected by the work that we are doing. Mm -hmm. And I'm pleased, so pleased that he was alive when the book published because he has since passed away god rest his soul and he was so so happy that someone took the time to understand who bob was as a person that mm -hmm. is and, and we've said this as well is you know we're telling bob's story but it's not just bob's story it's the story of 200 people it's the story of all those people who wanted to tell their stories, who were told that their stories weren't important or who were told that their stories weren't interesting enough. And that's how you learn about some of the, Bob's life was fascinating. I mean, if mm. you read, I mean, the reason it's so long is he's, he did an incredible amount of work in his life. He had an incredible um, drive in his personal life, in his work life. He was interesting, he was funny, he was clever, uh, he was charismatic. He's the kind of guy that if you met him on the street, you'd wanna be friends with him. And he was just fascinating as a person and kind. Bob was kind. He was kind, yes. He was kind to those, I'm, I'm remembering this quote that, that his friend Leo said to us. He said he was kind to those he worked with, he was kind to those he knew. 
and to just look for scandal is to do him a true disservice uh, because we all have many layers to our lives. And mm -hmm. yes, he did have an addiction that did make him do things that you and I would not do. And that he would not have done if he had not had an addiction. But he deserves a whole, a whole story. And many, many publishing companies will want a certain percentage of scandal. Carol, you can speak to that better than I can, because I know we've talked about it. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll say, well, we want this book, but, you know, you need to have at least 30 percent scandal. Well, and that's and that's very true, because you have to remember that a publishing company is looking to sell books. They mm. don't necessarily care what the topic is, as long as you're established and your your topic is interesting. Now, when Linda and I and Dee were looking for publishers, it it was tough because while I'm in the publishing industry, I do healthcare publishing. My healthcare publishing company is not going to publish a celebrity biography. It didn't matter who it was. Um, but I was fortunate enough to be directed to a publisher who is our publisher now. Um, his name is Mike Aloisi, and he is in Massachusetts. And Yay. he is... Um, he opened his publishing company as an author himself because he understood that an author wants to tell their story. So whether you're you're writing a fiction, whether you're writing a nonfiction, uh, yes, editing is involved and, and so on and so forth. But you publish the book you want to publish. And that is why the book is the way it is that Mike let us do what we wanted to do. And, and we were pretty stubborn in that we knew how we wanted to tell Bob's story. We don't put the addiction, we don't run the sex all the way through the book. We tell Bob's life in the first nine chapters, nine or 10 chapters of the book and keep that sexual addiction out of it. Because if you have that addiction happy every single time you turn a page, you can't see the forest through the trees, but then we take that addiction. We go all the way back to the 1950s and we discuss it in a very, uh, you know, clinically and um, profound and constructive way so that you can understand where it's coming from. No, Bob Crane was not perfect. And here is here's the chink in his armor, you might say. But a publisher, a mainline publisher, your random house or your, you know, they're, they're looking at a book that that's going to be 350 pages max. And of that book, you know, two thirds of it, you know, scandal and murder and sex. Yeah, get, get that all in there because the rest of it, we're not interested, not interested. We're just in the business to sell books. Um, and so we were very fortunate that we came into contact with Mike and his publishing company, AM Inc., uh, publishing. Uh, at the time we published the book, it was Author Mike Inc. Uh, and he has since changed it to AM Inc. Publishing. And, you know, to his credit, he allowed us to do what we wanted to do. And he's very proud of the book as well. He's very proud of the work that we've done with it. He's very, very proud of the work that we continue to do, not just to talk about Bob, but everything that we do here also promotes the book, which our author proceeds go either to different charities uh, or they go into continuing our work, whether it's with podcasts or, you know, the website or traveling and giving presentations and, and doing all of those things uh, just to keep the awareness going. Um, you know, that is all very helpful to to what we're trying to do in the bigger picture. But yeah, your your basic publishing company isn't going to publish what we were able to publish. And, and I'm very, very, we are very grateful to Mike for allowing us to publish the book that we wanted to publish and the vision that we had to tell Bob Crane's complete and true story. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, I'm really happy that it worked out that way for you guys, too. And you were able to really write the story you wanted to tell, because, I mean, it seems like there's the Bob Crane that his friends and loved ones knew and the one that you wrote about in your book and then there's the bob crane who was kind of like a character that the media created that's absolutely right yeah character that, that, that's exactly yes. right he it is a character versus or a, a human being a character mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
That's so sad. And so I'm really grateful also that we we got in touch and you're I mean, I'm able to try to help you guys get this story out as well. I think it's I think it's great and more people should know about it. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. <laughs> yeah. So speaking of which, um, let me see, where else can we find you? I know that you guys have the podcast. Um, hold on a second. Flip side, the true story of Bob Crane. And I know that, Carol, you also do uh, Hogan's Heroes Review. Where else can we? Yeah find information yes, from you guys so so yeah so everything that we do uh whether it's the podcasts um whether it's when we're appearing on podcasts like yours uh we'll put up the the links to to any of the the different uh podcasts or shows that we've been on uh you could get everything that we're doing about bob crane at vote for bob crane.org that's our website it's vote the number four bob crane.org and that just has everything that we do. It's you can find where to buy the book there. You can find where, uh, you know, if we have any events, we did a big virtual event last year. Um, I'm going to the Liberty Aviation Museum in July, which is where the Hogan's Heroes um, collection is. Uh, they're in Port Clinton, Ohio. And every year, uh, with the exception of the COVID years, I've gone out there to uh, do book signings and um uh, give presentations. And, you know, if you come to the museum, you get to play with some of the uniforms too, which is, which is kind of cool. So they have Hogan's complete uniform. They have Clink's and Schultz's, um, uh, most of their uniforms. Uh, they have the coffee pot listening device and they have, uh, other pieces of, of costumes, other pieces of props. And it's a really, really fun time. But then there are other events that we do as well throughout the year. Uh, and then any any of these, um, you know, any of the shows that we appear on. So that's where you can find everything. It's voteforbobcrane.org. How fun. Okay, awesome. So again, that was Carol Ford and Linda Groundwater. Them as well as Dee Young are the authors of Bob Crane, the different the, I'm sorry, the authors of Bob Crane, The Definitive Biography. I really appreciate you guys coming on here. Um, do you have any questions, anything else you want to talk about? Oh, no, I think the book kind of speaks for itself. And we're so grateful that you've taken the time to let us tell a bit more about um, the true story of Bob Crane, which is um, what that flip side is. You know, the, the reason that the, we use the word flip side, uh, which was actually originally the working title of of the biography is that you know the side that people see through that small crooked lens is very different from the real bob and so any chance that we have to tell a a bit of his true story um, we are so grateful so we are so so grateful Didi. thank you so much yes thank you so much Didi. thank you guys i really appreciate you thank, thank you. you have a good night thank you you too Hey Future Unnaturalists, I'm Emily. And I'm Andy. And we are the hosts of Unnatural, a true crime podcast. Each week we'll dive into some of the most unnerving crimes that this unnatural world has to offer. Listen for Unnatural on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And remember, make good choices. And don't get got. Bye. Bark box, bark box, bark box, bark box. You guys know my dogs, Jude and Eleanor Rigby. Well, we just started getting them bark box, and I'm telling you, your dogs will love you. No more are they angry at the mailman. No more, I say. 
It's like a box of dog joy that's delivered every month, and each box tells a different story with different themed toys, treats, and photo-worthy props. Typically, what we get in each box is a couple of toys, a couple of treats, and a chew, but you can actually tailor fit your box to fit your dog's needs. Guys, I'm telling you, your dogs will love you, even more than they already do. So try it out, and if you use my link, you'll get a free extra month of BarkBox, which is a $35 value. So just head to BarkBox.com slash Broken Limelight and get started on your first BarkBox today. BarkBox, 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 BarkBox. Nailed it, Jude.